The following story takes place between the years 1272 and 1399. I imagine you've all seen Braveheart. It's a great film, isn't it? Well, I'm sorry to have to inform you that it's also very historically inaccurate, to the point that the real Braveheart was actually a different guy altogether. But look, on the bright side, in today's episode, we're going to learn about the real events of the period, along with the history of the last four Plantagenet kings, three Edwards and one Richard. First things first, astute observers who watched our last episode will have noticed that it ended in 1272 with the coronation of Edward I, and so they'll be asking, Hey, how come he's Edward I if there's already been other kings named Edward, hmm? Well, that's because back then, people were more into soubriquets, that's a fancy word for nickname, so historians didn't really start numbering kings until some centuries later, and in many cases those historians had their own reasons for when to start counting. Maybe because they sought to indicate a clear rupture point, in this particular case perhaps the Norman rule, or perhaps because they simply didn't know how many previous kings had shared a name. Some history be like that. That's disappointing. Now, one more quick note before we start our story. Edward I had a brother, Edmund Crouchback, who gave rise to the House of Lancaster, while Edward himself would later originate the House of York. You don't need to remember this right now, but it will be important for our next video, in which we cover Game of Thrones, uh, I mean, the War of the Roses. Okay, with all that out of the way, we can finally get down to business. From the very beginning of his rule, Edward I, better known as Edward Longshanks because apparently he was quite tall, wanted to expand his domains. In fact, immediately after being anointed by the Archbishop of Canterbury, Edward removed his crown, promising not to wear it again until he had recovered all the lands that his father, Henry III, had lost. The problem was that France was very powerful at that moment, so Edward began by turning his attention to the neighbouring land of Wales, which he started invading in 1276. The official excuse for this was that the Prince of Wales, Llewellyn ap Gruffydd, had stopped paying homage and, to add insult to injury, intended to marry Eleanor de Montfort, daughter of the man who years ago had rebelled against his father, imprisoned Edward and almost overthrown the Plantagenet dynasty. Edward I sent a massive army on this campaign, and they proceeded directly to take the island of Anglesey, known as the Breadbasket of Wales. After witnessing their success, Llewellyn had to surrender almost all of Wales to the English, save for the Kingdom of Gwynedd. Edward then sent hundreds of English colonists to settle down in Wales, and that caused considerable disputes amongst the population. This eventually led Llewellyn's brother Daffid, who had previously supported Edward, to rise up against him in 1282. Llewellyn joined him but was killed in battle, while Daffid was captured and executed. Then, with the Statute of Rhudlan, or Statute of Wales, signed in 1284, all of Wales came under English control. In order to keep the Welsh in check, Edward built several fortresses and castles, like the ones at Harlech and Conwy. And then there was Carnarfon Castle, where Edward's wife, Eleanor of Castile, gave birth to the future king, Edward II, who was thus named Prince of Wales, and since then, this is the title given to the heirs of the British throne. And the Welsh just love it. I'm warning you, being this sarcastic is dangerous! Another conflict that arose during Edward's reign was with the Jewish community. Back then, these poor people lived in ghettos and were forced to wear distinctive markings. In 1275, Edward issued the Statute of the Jewry, forbidding the lending of money, which was their most common profession, and thus forcing them to find other ways to make a living. But the problem was, nobody wanted to sell them any land or accept them as apprentices. Later, in 1290, Parliament said to the King, Hey Eddie, if you got rid of the Jews, you could grab all their property. And so it took him about one heartbeat to make the decision to expel them all from England. Thus, these poor lot were left with no other option but to relocate, mostly to France, Scotland, the Netherlands and Poland. On a positive note, Edward issued other statutes which were far more progressive. 
He reformed politics to provide free men with more representation in Parliament, affording them more rights regardless of their birth and wealth, as well as punishing bribery, investing in road maintenance, peacekeeping, and several things of this nature. Going to make this country a better place. And now we have to look at the tricky issue of Scotland, which is very messy, but also very interesting. It all began in 1286, when the King of Scotland, Alexander III, fell off his horse and broke his neck, leaving no proper heir. All of his sons had died earlier, but there was a glimmer of hope since he had one surviving granddaughter, which his daughter Margaret of Scotland had had with the King of Norway, Eric II. The problem was that this girl, known as Margaret Maid of Norway, lived in Scandinavia and was just three years old. In light of this, the nobility decided to establish a council of six guardians of Scotland until the child grew up, which was a good compromise to keep the peace between the two most powerful families in Scotland, the Balliols and the Bruces, both descendants of previous kings. Unfortunately, that solution was short-lived because a few years later, in 1290, little Margaret died as she was making her way to Scotland to be crowned. It's a tragedy, a real tragedy. This led to the Great Cause, a bizarre situation in which 13 different claimants to the throne came forward. Fearing a civil war, the Guardians of Scotland asked Edward I to resolve the dispute, since Margaret had been betrothed to his son. The main candidates were John Balliol, son of an English noble who had fought beside Edward's father Henry III, and Robert de Bruce, who had gone on the Ninth Crusade along with Edward and his brother. But here is when Edward the Longshanks began to earn his other nickname, Hammer of the Scots, demanding to be recognised as feudal overlord of Scotland before he would step in as arbiter. After a process which lasted nearly two years, John Balliol was elected as new King of Scotland, but Things didn't go very well for him because, for starters, he had to pay homage to Edward. And then it all became much worse, as England began to raise taxes and demand soldiers for its campaign against France. Eventually, the Scots became fed up and decided to ally with the French. Perhaps Edward had even sought this from the beginning, because it gave him the perfect excuse to invade Scotland, kicking off the First War of Scottish Independence in 1296. The cities of Berwick and Edinburgh swiftly fell into English hands and, after the Battle of Dunbar, John Balliol was made to abdicate and imprisoned at the Tower of London. Edward I thus became ruler of Scotland and it's at this point we have to start spoiling the fun for those who believed that Braveheart was remotely realistic. Feel free to tell us how glad or disappointed you are in the comments section. Oh, it wouldn't do you much good, I can't read. To begin with, the film shows the conflict starting in 1280, after the death of the Scottish King Alexander III, which is totally wrong, as we've just seen. Yes, we understand that it's a fictional film, not a documentary, so they're allowed to make up whatever they want to fit the story, but we also believe it's important to know what's true and what isn't. William Wallace is seven feet tall! The first Scottish rebellion was led by the young Robert the Bruce, grandson of the previously mentioned Robert de Bruce, but he didn't last for very long and ended up submitting to the English. That was when a resistance movement emerged, led by William Wallace, and also Andrew de Murray, although he was left out of the film for some reason. It seems that Wallace was the son of a landowner in Ayrshire, so although he wasn't part of the high nobility, the guy certainly didn't grow up in a prehistoric looking hut in the middle of nowhere. It's not 100% clear how his beef with the English began. One version of the story goes that one day, the English High Sheriff of Lanark demanded some taxes from his family and, since they couldn't pay, he killed them all. Others say that his lands were taken from him. Either way, the film's depiction is certainly not true. First of all, because there are no definitive records about him having a wife, it seems this was added to the story several centuries later, but more importantly, the whole deal with Prima Noctis, whereby feudal lords had the right to sleep with any woman on their wedding night, is total drivel. Again, total drivel. Anyway, whatever the reason, the point is that Wallace really wanted to murder some Englishmen, so he sieged Lanark Fort and killed the High Sheriff. He then fled to the forests where he joined Andrew de Murray's group of rebels. Together they defeated the army at the famous Battle of Stirling Bridge. Yep, you heard it right. It's called that because the key to the battle was a bridge, which the Scots took advantage of in order to manoeuvre the English into a bottleneck and massacre them. But I guess that wouldn't have looked very epic in a film. 
Oh, and the Scots also didn't paint their faces blue. That was a picked thing from several centuries earlier, and neither did they wear kilts. Those appeared several centuries later. In reality, they wore armour and basically looked like any other medieval army. Back in the real world, although Andrew de Moray died from his wounds, this battle was a huge victory for the Scottish rebels, and William was named Guardian of Scotland. He continued fighting against the English, but was not able to take any enemy castles, and he certainly never conquered York. Then, in 1298, he faced King Edward himself at the Battle of Falkirk, where the Scottish troops were defeated. One account says that the Scottish nobility ordered a retreat of the cavalry when they realised the day was lost, while others believe it was a planned betrayal, because they were jealous of a pleb like Wallace being named Guardian of Scotland. However, there isn't much evidence of this second version, and even less that the traitor was Robert the Bruce, as shown in the film, mainly because he wasn't even present at that battle. Oh, and the film also shows a company of Irishmen who joined the Scottish army to fight English oppression. Totally made up, sorry. Didn't happen. After this harsh defeat, the Scottish resistance moved to the Highlands, where they held out for several years. Eventually, Edward managed to take control of Scotland, following the siege of Stirling Castle, the last key stronghold. In order to take the castle, the English built a massive trebuchet nicknamed Warwolf, which is a pretty scary name to be fair. It is shown at the start of the film Outlaw King, where we also see how Robert the Bruce and Edward became besties, but that piece didn't last very long. King's terms will never live up to them. <laughs> Soon afterwards, William Wallace was betrayed and handed over to the English. It is told that the king ordered him to be castrated and disemboweled alive, and then quartered, with his limbs sent to be displayed at different northern towns. Yep, Edward was pretty nasty with his enemies. <laughs> Robert the Bruce then rose up as leader of Scotland. He initially had some competition in the figure of John Comyn, another powerful noble who had also previously claimed the Scottish throne. But in 1306, Bruce met with him at Greyfriars Kirk in Dumfries and ended up killing Comyn, so he was finally crowned King of Scotland at Schoon in 1306. However, because of the English invasion and conflicts with other Scottish factions, he then had to flee to the Hebrides. By the way, if you like this character, there is a film from 2019 called Robert the Bruce, which tells his story. You might even consider it a sequel to Braveheart, since Robert is played by the same actor. Rumour has it that he subscribed to this channel and always upvotes our videos, and we encourage you to follow his example. And now we have to leave Scotland and return to England for a while, because some big changes were afoot. In 1307, the Hammer of the Scots broke. As he was travelling north to continue fighting the Scots, King Edward Longshanks contracted dysentery and died. Upon Edward Longshanks' death, his fourth son, Edward of Carnarfon, was crowned as Edward II, the new King of England. The first thing he did was cool down the tension with France, and for that he married a daughter of the French King Philip IV, the fair Isabella, who came to be known as the She-Wolf of France. Pretty cool. Once again, Braveheart shows how Wallace and Isabella had a fling in sunny Scotland, but logically this couldn't have happened because she never set a foot in Britain until 1308, three years after Wallace's execution. Plus, she was just 13 years old at the time. However, although it wasn't with Wallace, she really did betray her husband, as we will soon see. What is accurate is that Edward II and Isabella did not get on too well, mainly because the king maintained a very close relationship with the Earl of Cornwall, Piers Gaveston. While it's not 100% clear what these two got up to in private, it is certainly true that Gaveston became a very influential figure in Edward's entourage. It is also said he was very arrogant and mocked the nobles, giving them ridiculous nicknames, so they quickly became fed up and started plotting to get rid of him, as nobles tend to do. In the film, this is resolved when the character, which they renamed Philip for some reason, is defenestrated, another fancy word meaning thrown out of a window. But the reality is that in 1308, several barons, led by the king's cousin Thomas of Lancaster, pressured Edward and eventually had Gaveston exiled to Ireland, although the king managed to bring him back the following year. This was not the only aspect in which Edward II was different from his father. He had a far weaker character and was easily influenced, so the nobility didn't trust him very much. This is why, once again led by Thomas of Lancaster, they eventually presented Edward with the Ordinances of 1311, 
which significantly diluted his power. Among other things, he would now require Parliament's approval to grant lands, declare war, and even leave the country. What makes you think you can treat me like a child? The nobles also took this opportunity to finally get rid of Gaveston. They captured, judged, and executed him. And the king got so mad with Thomas of Lancaster that he began to plan a war against him and other agitators. However, after some mediation by the King of France and the Pope, everyone kissed and made up in 1313. And now we return to Scotland, where Robert the Bruce's rebellion had flared up once again. The Scottish king had taken advantage of the change in England's throne to regain several castles in the north. One notable event was the Battle of Loudon Hill in 1307, where just about 500 Scots defeated a 3,000 strong English army, thanks to trenches and traps they set up in a marshy terrain which took out their cavalry. After this, the only major castle left under English control was the one at Stirling, which the Scots sieged in 1330. In 1314, once he finally got his court in order, Edward II sent a large army up north to meet Robert the Bruce at the Battle of Bannockburn, where it was crushed with 200 English knights killed and many others made prisoners. After this sound defeat, Edward retreated from Scotland, while at the same time, this and other battles earned Robert the Bruce an interesting nickname after death. Braveheart. Bet you didn't see that one coming, did you? As we explained before, Edward II was easily influenced by those around him, and now that Gaveston was out of the picture, that vacuum was filled by the Dispenser family, particularly Hugh Dispenser the Elder and Hugh Dispenser the Younger. The latter especially as he became Royal Chamberlain, the King's right hand, helping Edward to improve the economy following the Scottish debacle. Hugh then began to accumulate more and more power, history was repeating itself. To complicate matters further, that period saw the Great Famine. It was a time of constant torrential rain and very cold temperatures, which led to crop failures, food shortages, and huge death rates. In the year 1321, many nobles became fed up with Hugh the Younger's influence in court, and a civil war broke out, known as the Dispenser War. On the rebel side, there was the king's old frenemy, Thomas of Lancaster, and especially Roger Mortimer, Earl of March, who will play a key role in future events. Eventually, Parliament forced the king to get rid of Dispenser. <laughs> to dispense with Dispenser, thank you. You see what I did there? Oh. <laughs> but his exile didn't last very long at all, as he quickly garnered new supporters and returned to England, where he managed to put down the rebellion in 1322. Thomas of Lancaster was executed, and Roger Mortimer was jailed at the Tower of London, although a year later he managed to escape and flew to France. This was the beginning of the end for King Edward II. Let's see how it came about. The current King of France was Charles IV, brother to Edward's wife Isabella, she wolf of France, who was completely fed up of her husband and the damn dispenser, since rumour said he treated her like a maid, had his wife spy on her, and seized her lands. At one point, Edward II sent Isabella to France along with the delegation, and she decided to stay there, first playing dumb and later asking for her son, Prince Edward, to be sent over. As you can probably imagine, something was afoot. It turned out that Isabella had met up and got involved with the fugitive Roger Mortimer, and together they began to plan how to take over England, using the prince and with support from other exiled English nobles. In 1326, Roger Mortimer led a fleet of nearly a hundred ships to England. They landed at Orwell and were soon joined by several more English nobles, including Henry of Lancaster and the king's half-brother Edmund of Woodstock. After taking Bristol Castle, the rebels captured and killed Hugh Dispenser the Elder, while the King and Hugh the Younger took refuge in Wales. They were soon captured as well, whereupon Hugh the Younger was tortured and executed in the William Wallace style, while King Edward was forced to abdicate in his son. He was then locked up and died a few months later under unclear circumstances. <coughs> Bloody murder. <coughs> he was killed. Murder. <coughs> At the age of 15, Edward III, or Edward of Windsor, became King of England and went on to rule for the next half century, between 1327 and 1377. During his early reign, little Eddie, or rather his mum and Roger Mortimer, managed to restore the power that the crown had lost in previous years, and everything seemed to be going well in the Kingdom of England. 
1328, Isabella and Mortimer made peace with Robert the Bruce and signed the Treaty of Edinburgh Northampton. This put an end to the First War of Scottish Independence, which had lasted for 32 years. This also recognised Robert the Bruce as King of Scotland, and here and after they left him to rule in relative peace. A little bit later, in 1330, Edward began having trouble with Mortimer, allegedly because he was dipping his hands into the treasury. Eventually, Edward went after him, sieging Nottingham Castle where his men took advantage of a secret tunnel to enter the fortress and catch him unawares. I just came through that unsecure back door. Mortimer was then judged and executed, and with him out of the way, Edward III was able to rule unimpended, which he did pretty well. He travelled all over England to understand the problems of common folk firsthand and organised many jousts and tournaments to recreate tales like the legend of King Arthur, which had become very fashionable at the time. But then, 1332 saw the outbreak of the Second War of Scottish Independence. This came about through an old rivalry. You see, Scotland was ruled by the son of Robert the Bruce, David II, but the son of his old enemy John Balliol, Edward Balliol, wanted to usurp the throne and requested support from England's Edward III. At the Battle of Halidon Hill in 1333, the English defeated David II's troops and he had to flee to France, leaving Edward Balliol to be crowned as the new King of Scotland. And since we mentioned France, let's open that can of worms now. In the year 1328, French King Charles IV died, and without a proper heir since he had no children or brothers. Given the situation, King Edward III considered that he had a claim to the French throne, since his mother Isabella was Charles's sister. But the French aristocracy laughed him off, saying, <laughs> Mais non, Edouard, you must be uh, joking. <laughs> and then placed Charles's cousin, Philip VI, as King of France, giving rise to the Valois dynasty. Henry III couldn't do much about this, so he accepted begrudgingly, but it didn't take very long for trouble to arise, specifically over the territory of Gascony. This tension eventually led to the famous Hundred Years' War, fought between England and France. Actually, it lasted for over 116 years, but that doesn't sound nearly as catchy. Nitpicking nerds. Just a quick note to let you know that we aren't going to go into too much detail about this conflict, since we intend to make a series on the history of France and this war took place on French soil, so today we'll only be mentioning the most relevant events to our story. Although the war was declared in 1337, the English didn't actually start attacking France until 1340, when they won an encounter at Sluys, which gave them control over the English Channel, thus preventing France from launching a counter-invasion. However, the first great land clash in this war was the Battle of Cressy, which took place in 1346. It is said that this was the first significant battle in which Europeans used cannons, even though they were still very rudimentary. Instead, the main differential aspect in this war were the English archers. One very important participant in this battle was the English King's son, Edward of Woodstock, Prince of Wales, generally known as the Black Prince. He was called this because he wore a dark armour, not because he was secretly adopted. Meanwhile, in the far north, King David II returned to Scotland and supported his French allies by attacking England, leading to the Battle of Neville's Cross in 1346. Henry III won that encounter and captured David, who was locked up for the next 12 years. Then, just when it looked like Edward would fulfil the Plantagenet ambition of gaining control over the Kingdom of Scotland, a tiny obstacle messed up his plans. We're talking really small here. Microscopic, actually, for it was a bacteria. We're referring, of course, to the Black Death. Oh my God! Once again, this is such a broad topic that it merits its own separate video, but in this case, we've already made that one. It was our first video, and although it's not our best because we were still figuring many things out, you might enjoy it nevertheless. For now, suffice to say that the Black Death was arguably the most devastating pandemic in human history, as it killed approximately 100 million people between 1346 and 1353. Naturally, the Hundred Years' War was interrupted several times throughout this period, and yet, bizarrely, England continued to hold tournaments, like the one that took place in Windsor in 1349, when the King created the Order of the Garter, inspired by Arthurian myths in an attempt to unite the nobility. <laughs> By 1355, England was starting to recover from the plague, so Edward III sent his son, the Black Prince, to Gascony. 
He obtained great military victories, but these were accompanied by horrible sackings and murder. The Black Prince then advanced towards the north, moving towards the Loire River and laying waste to everything he found along the way. Near Poitiers, the French King John II came out to fight him, but was defeated and captured along with his son. This led to the Treaty of Bretigny, signed in 1360, which put an end to the first phase of the war. At this point, England had France held by the shortened curlies. Oh, Moreover, the Second War of Scottish Independence also ended right around this time, specifically in the year 1357. King David II was freed after paying a hefty ransom, and he reclaimed the throne of Scotland from the regent who had ruled in his absence, his nephew, Robert Stuart. Later, in 1371, the king died without an heir, and Robert became the new king of Scotland, founding the Stuart dynasty. Back and forth, back and forth. Now that the actual war between England and France had ceased, in 1366, the conflict between them moved to the Kingdom of Castile. To give you some context, this was the domain of King Pedro I, or King Pedro the Cruel, that is, until a rebellion erupted led by his bastard half-brother Enrique of Trastamara, or Enrico the Fratricidal, for reasons that will soon become obvious. The King of France, Charles V, sent a group of mercenaries led by Bertrand de Gusclin to support the usurper Enrique, while the Black Prince and his brother John of Gaunt and their Gascon troops disembarked in the Iberian Peninsula to support King Pedro. Together they obtained a noble victory at the Battle of Neyera in 1367, but after that they had a fallout because Pedro said to the Black Prince, Actually, I can't pay you, and in fact, I'm not even going to give you the lordship of Biscay as we had agreed. Sorry, amigo. So the English left. I could give you my word as a Spaniard. No good. I've known too many Spaniards. In 1369, Enrique of Trastamara managed to kill Pedro the Cruel and became the new King of Castile. Thanks to the support of King Charles of France, the Castilian fleet became one of the most powerful in Europe and at this point it turned against England, achieving a great triumph at the Battle of La Rochelle in 1372. England then sought a naval ally and turned to Portugal, leading to the Truce of Bruges, signed in 1375. By then, things weren't looking too good for the English, as they only maintained their hold on Calais and a narrow strip of land going from Bordeaux to Bayonne. And far from improving, Plantagenet fortunes were about to take a turn for the worse, because both Edward III and his son the Black Prince fell ill and died. At this point, the English crown went to the Black Prince's son, Richard II, or Richard of Bordeaux. Since he was just a ten-year-old kid, Parliament sought to prevent his uncle, John of Gaunt, from usurping the throne, and so instead of appointing him as a single regent, they decided that a council of nobles would rule. As you can see, Parliament gained considerable power in these times, and it is worth noting the rise of the commons, compromised by burghers and small landowners, who began to make their voices heard. All this time, the Hundred Years' War had been at a relative standstill, since the French also had a child sitting on their throne, Charles VI, or Charles the Beloved, after his father had passed. In addition, both kingdoms had been forced to raise taxes considerably to pay for the war, and that had led to discontent and numerous revolts, particularly by peasants who were quite fed up with the situation. The most notable was the Peasants' Revolt of 1381, or Rebellion of Wat Tyler, when the rebels managed to seize the Tower of London, but just when things looked to be getting out of control, young King Richard managed to stop the revolt by making several promises and concessions. He would later break all of them like a true statesman. But the key point is that the rebellion was resolved. Oh, and that what Tyler guy ended up being executed, of course. Although neither Richard II nor the English people had much appetite for war, several vultures, sorry, I mean scumbags, oh sorry again, <laughs> I mean nobles, who were lining their pockets thanks to the conflict with France, started to cause tension in Parliament. In 1387, five important earls, including the King's uncle, Thomas of Woodstock, and his cousin, Henry Bolingbroke, Earl of Derby, formed an alliance against Richard. 
These lot, known as the Lords Appellant, staged a coup and took control of the Royal Council following the Battle of Radcock Bridge. Then they exiled or executed Richard's councillors and allies. It was a total purge, but at least he managed to keep his life and even the throne. I realise it could be so much worse. Throughout the following decade, Richard II continued to be the king in name, while the real power was wielded by the Lord's Appellant. So instead he turned his attention towards architecture, painting and literature. He hosted parties attended by renowned poets like Geoffrey Chaucer, and he also ordered an extensive rebuilding of Westminster Hall, which by then had become the seat of Parliament. One figure whom we should mention is John Wycliffe, a theologian from Oxford University who founded the Lollards movement. He argued against the church's riches and worship of images, rejected celibacy, wars, violence and several other important precepts at the time. For many, Wycliffe was the spiritual father of the Hussites and even the Protestant Reformation. But now it's back to the action, because despite living for several years in a state of relative calm, King Richard II always harboured a deep desire for revenge against the rebels. And he obviously heard it's a dish best served cold because he waited for almost a decade. For a very long time. To give you a quick idea of what went down, it covered the last two years of his reign and they are known as the tyranny of Richard II. His vengeance began in 1397, when he accused all the Lords Appellant of conspiracy and treated them just like they had done with his allies, exiling some and executing others. Two of the exiles were Thomas Mowbray and his cousin Henry Bolingbroke, with the latter receiving an insult to go with the injury, as the king expropriated all his family's possessions upon the death of his father, John of Gaunt. However, that turned out to be a huge mistake, because in 1399, when Richard II sailed to Ireland in order to quell a rebellion, Henry Bolingbroke took advantage of the king's absence to disembark in England and claim his rightful inheritance. Then, seeing that not only was he not met with any resistance, in fact many people were joining his cause, Henry got all cocky and made a play for the throne. And so it happened that when Richard finally returned, he found that the country had been taken away from him. He was forced to meet with Henry at Flint Castle and abdicate in exchange for his life, whereupon he was locked up at Pontefract Castle, although he died very soon afterwards. And by died, I mean he was killed, which is usually what happened to anyone surrendering a crown in the Middle Ages. You can't prove anything. Parliament then appointed Henry Bolingbroke as the new king, Henry IV, thus putting an end to the direct line of the Plantagenet kings, since he belonged to one of its scions, the House of Lancaster. This ushered in a fascinating period, which we will cover in the next episode, our last about the history of medieval England, which will see the resolution of the Hundred Years' War, and also how the Plantagenet cadet branches of Lancaster and York fought over the throne in a brutal civil war with a very pretty name, which Game of Thrones was based on, the War of the Roses. And the rest is history. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to subscribe to the channel and leave us a big like. Take care, and I'll see you in the next video. An encounter at Slews. Slews? Oh my god, what the hell? That's not a place. Can you hear the seagulls? Had stopped paying oh home. Why is it so hard? Classy? Classy? Is that how you say it? Hmm? Led by Bertrand de Gusclin in the Iberian Pianet. Oh, so many words. And in fact, I'm not even going, oh, it's kind of gone like a uh, Greek London. Sorry, amigo. Oh, I'm getting into it now. Oh, please don't put this in the video.